Why'd you have binary cells back then? <laughs> <laughs> one, 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 one. Okay, sounds alright. One, two, three. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, you probably watched the talk by that Facebook guy, I forgot his name, who was presenting the React GS for the first time three years ago. Yeah, <laughs> that guy. And uh, his talk was captioned uh, Rethinking Best Practices. So, again, here we are rethinking the best practices, and I'm sorry if you didn't like them in the beginning. So, um, I'm a, I am a developer of Vasil Borodiak, and welcome to the offline episode of Fun with Stamps. Um, <laughs> uh, I have these uh, series of blog posts, you can find them on media medium.com. This talk is going to be highly complex, especially for people who are not into software development uh, for a long time. I, uh, I apologize uh, that there will be plentiful of terminology probably and uh, code. There will be a lot of code, so you might want to come closer, sit closer. Um, and this talk implies that you have previous experience with object-oriented programming, with classes, ECMAScript 6, you know? No. Okay. Um, ask me, you can stop me anytime and ask your questions, because it is, will be complicated. Uh, so, how do we typically create our classes? For example, we have if you can see, it doesn't really matter. This is a class with a constructor, the method X and the property A, and then if you want to reuse an implementation, you inherit the class and you add one more something, in this case, property B. Now, if you want to reuse the property B implementation, you inherit again and add a few more uh, behaviors, in this case, method Y and Z. And then you can even uh, replace a method with one more inheritance step, uh, if your language allows that. And then at the end of the day, if you are, if you have ever worked in the business, big business applications or even medium applications using classes, then at the end of the day, it is always like that: a pile of useless shit, lots of pain, and lots of suffering. But not everything is used is there. There is one useful thing as you can see. You see? Useful thing. And you might even want it. So, actually, you, uh, you need like only four things from this final class. Constructor, property B, method X, and a useful thing. But unfortunately, they all declare in various classes. So in order to have all these four features, you have to use this big, bulky, ugly hell on the earth. Okay, uh, for those who don't know, CTOR is a short for constructor. Alright, if you think I came up with this story just now or... No, that's totally true. Um, for example, this is the most used class in .NET framework. It's called dictionary. In Java, it's called map. In all other languages, it's actually called map, just .NET. Um, and you see, it already implements only eight interfaces on it. And of course, it's got seven constructors, which you use daily. Of course, you need all seven constructors, like, all the time, don't you? And it's got five properties. You use them as well, like, daily, right? Yeah, sure. Why not? And it's got 15 methods, which you actually don't know they even exist. Yeah. So, when I was a .NET developer for many, many years, uh, typically, I was using, 95% uh, of, of the time I was using the dictionary, I was using only <laughs> the constructor, the get key, uh, get value by key, and set value, and iterate over the map. 
So this is my 95% of using the bloody map. Why do I hell need all the other things? I don't know. Let's move on. So imagine you have never heard of classes and inheritance, but now you would need to redesign them. What would you do? How would you implement them? Um, so on the left here we have blue boxes. Blue boxes are behaviors. Don't read what's on them. It's just behaviors and you need only four of them and you like grab four of them and somehow magically you uh, combine them into a, well, the class you need. Only the four things useful for you. Why don't we have it in every language? No. In every language we have inheritance. Okay. Uh, this trick uh, is the same to what CSS modules do with this compose keyword. Talk, uh, thank you for the workshop yesterday. Uh, the same thing was uh, presented by Luke Brook yesterday when he was talking about CSS composition things. So this is exactly the same idea. No any difference. And, uh, so the, the stamps exist for more than two years, but it wasn't like clear that CSS modules, for example, and stamps are so uh, similar. At this point of time, a typical Java developer would be like, what? <laughs> what? That, that's impossible, right? In Java and other classic oh, yes, big languages. Like, <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 get, I'll get to it. Because I'm not done a developer. I know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, to make that happen easily, uh, Eric Elliott invented stamps and I developed him to the state I'm going to present. So, stamps. What are stamps? Stamps are those behaviors on the left. Those blue boxes are behaviors. So, uh, and you can like, combine them. Stamps are composable behaviors and uh, stamps are not a library or a module. Stamps are a specification, just like promises. Promises are specification, stamps are specifications. Uh, yeah, and different implementation of this specification, they are compatible with each other. And stamps also are factory functions, just like classes in JavaScript, they are factory functions. Same thing, stamps are factory functions. Um, so, the only thing the specification tells about is this, is this compose function. This is a standalone function. Um, this is how would I create a constructor behavior. We call it initializes. So, you just call the compose function, pass the plain object, which have a function. So, whenever I create an object from this uh, stem on the bottom, you see, it will print hello can jazz. Now, a stem with a method, stem which declares a method. The same thing, the compose standalone function, I pass an object and uh, I declare that it will have a method x. And here below, I create uh, a stem and I call the dot x method on it. And now the property B is also a stamp. I just declare, blah, 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 you see the same stuff. Uh, in the bottom, I create the stamp called property B, and I have access to the dot B property. Anybody confused at this point? Because this is core stuff. <laughs> um, now, more confused. More confused. More confusing. Uh, the stamp called useful thing, it declares that it will have static property called useful thing. And static properties are just like statics in classes. So in classes, you can call uh, the statics are attached to the class itself. So here we are attaching class statics like properties 
to the stamp itself. So you see on the bottom, I'm not creating any objects. I'm just calling the useful thing matter of a stamp. Can you go back one screen? That one. <laughs> back one. Yeah. So... You can instantiate the property B on that screen. What? On the next screen three, you don't instantiate useful thing? Yes, do not instantiate. Uh, properties are used for object instances. So we will attach the property B dot B to created object instances. But these we call them statics because they're exactly like class <laughs> in, in classes. Yeah. Statics they are attached to stamps or in maybe easier for you into classes. Where so the prototype it, function yeah. on that one is uh, it just attached to the function. It just attached yeah, the function, which is, well, we all know in JavaScript, functions, uh, methods are actually properties on objects, right? So this is a method dot useful thing, uh, which is, was attached to the stamp itself. And pay attention to this thing. If you do not understand this, ask again, because we will be using these static properties uh, in the future on these slides. Uh, a lot. So if you should understand that these are attached to stamps, not the instantiated objects. And now, um, <coughs> the magical part. Uh, I compose magically right, those previous stamps from previous slides, and I receive this uh, stamp one. There it is. Stem one is also a stem, like those four. Stem one is also a stem. Um, so the compose. I'm using the same compose function as you can see. Compose function can accept not only the plain objects but also stems, and it understands, distinguishes them both, and just combines them magically. All right. Um, very similar to CSS modules, by the way. So much similar. Um, so let's take a look, recap it there. So I, I, I can create um, objects from the stem one, stem one from a previous slide, you remember? This is a stem one, oh, where is it? Yeah. Stem one. And here yeah. I'm creating uh, an object from stem one then I can access method X from stem1, then I can access pro property B from stem1, from object, sorry, from instantiated objects. I can access method, the property B, and I'm accessing the uh, static uh, method on the stem itself. So stem1 get all the behaviors from all the previous stems. And this is the code altogether. I hope you can see. I import the compose function from somewhere, and I create four different stamps, then I merge them, of course, magically. Yeah. And then uh, I have uh, this uh, initializer called at this point of time. You see it, right? And then I'm calling the method X at this point of time. I hope it's the visual. And then I'm calling the property B. And then I'm calling the useful thing from the stem itself. Okay. Understandable, I hope. I think, Vessel, there's a couple of questions about that. Yeah, come on. Um, so you access the static method on the, on the, the class of the stem itself. Does if you were to try to access the static method on the instantiated object, is that alias to the static um, no. no, 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 no. Uh, the question was, if he will try to access the dot useful thing on an instance of an object, no, it's not available there. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, next slide. And this is exactly the same thing, but using uh, only one stem. So you see on the left, I'm using the compose function to create uh, uh, the stem one, but I just pass everything from the previous slides as a single uh, plain object, and then I call all these things uh, etc. 
exactly the same way. Hope that's clear. If you have any questions, stop me. Excuse me. Yep. So, if the initialize, you pass the numbers to the initialize? Yes, you can. Yes, as many as you want. Uh, the question was, can you pass arguments to initializers? Yes, you can, as many as you need. So now let's talk about stem.compose method. So you remember this uh, stem1 from previous slide, slides, and then similar to promises.then method, stems have .compose method. And this compose method is exactly the same magic. Um, so it's actually the same function. Um, and here I can use the dot .compose method. And you see, I can, can create the stem one from calling the <coughs> constructor dot .compose and then pass all the rest of the uh, uh, stems. And it will result, result with exactly the same stem, stem one in our case. I hope that's clear. Clear? Yeah, okay. And then you can do any way you want, like that, like that, like this. Here below I'm actually using a standalone compose function. And then I'm using the dot compose method, as you can see. So I'm using both at the same time, etc. You can do, uh, you can uh, like call it as you wish uh, in any order. So. Now you need to remember, important part, that uh, the compose, doesn't matter if it's a function or a method, the compose calls, uh, merges the metadata of all the stamps it, uh, it gets, and all the metadata of the plain objects as well. So it just merges metadata together and create one more stamp. So every compose method or function call always creates a new stem. Stems are immutable. They're not protected from actually dirty changing, but every time you call compose, you are creating a new stem. Now, uh, let's take a look at the collected metadata for that stem one. Um, you saw, right? There. And if I print the dot compose method, we know as a JavaScript developers, that functions are also objects and you can attach properties to objects, which is great. So this is what we are using. The dot .compose method serves as a metadata holder. So if I print the dot .compose uh, method, I will see that it is a function, it's got one property called initializers, it's got another property called methods, and the property called properties, and the property called static properties. <laughs> okay, this can be complicated. So, stamp.compose have four properties on it. These are the metadata of stamps. Questions? Yep. Uh, <coughs> so you can have multiple initializers? As many as you want. Yeah. Sounds tricky, but I'm not covering how many initializers, but uh, at the length, uh, ask me later, after the presentation. So, uh, now let's take a look at the classic example, uh, Java example, and convert this classic example to stamps. Uh, so the purpose is not to solve the problem, but to just show you what stamps actually are and how they work. Uh, so on, uh, on this example, you see, if, if you know Java, I hope you know kind of a Java or PHP or maybe C Sharp. If you don't, well, sorry. Um, here, I'm attaching metadata to a class and to the methods of the class uh, using the Java feature called annotations. And here, I am configuring the class with methods and properties uh, using the extend uh, inheritance with the extend keyword and adding two more uh, methods. And this is how I configure object instances. This is a typical uh, 
very standard dependency injection in Java. So I'm using dependency injection pattern here. There are other ways to set up your class in Java. Inheritance, annotations, dependency injection, composition, proxy design pattern, graphic design pattern, all the other, not all, many of the uh, different design patterns. Raise your hand if you read the design patterns by Gengar 4. <laughs> That's a lot of people. Okay. You don't need it. Right away. <laughs> Raise your hand if you, if you know what design patterns are. Oh, amazing. Shark, you don't know what design patterns are. Every interview asks this. So all that, all that thing on the left is nothing else but a process of configuring your class. We can we can keep going in here, um, but there is the other talks going to pick up at, up there at ten. Um, so I know Shark, you said you were keen to go. So design patterns I'm going. What's that? Only design patterns I'm going up there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if you need to just duck out quickly now, um, this, this is the chance, but anyone else wants to kick around here, that's fine. Um, we don't... No, we no, no. Okay. Thank you for staying with me, my two and a half listeners. There you go, there's people sleeping up in the future stuff. Well, they're going to have a nice surprise, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> so, all, all of these things on the left is nothing else but the process of the... Uh, collecting the metadata, the process of configuring your future classes and objects. So, how do you do this with stamps? Well, it's only this single word, the compose. This compose replaces many features of Java language and many design patterns. Those design patterns are well designed were created in order to make your objects, Java objects, flexible, but we don't need it in JavaScript. So Compose replaces all of that you have learned. And when I realized that all you need is, dot, is a Compose function, I was like, <laughs> why did I even learn this Ganga 4 book? <laughs> why did I? Uh, okay. Now, a complicated example. Uh, test and stun. I'm declaring that it will have two static properties and in the bottom I can call them as you can see. These are actually methods. It doesn't really... I'll show you the implementation later. So uh, let's... This is how would I uh, do the same as on the previous Java example. If you compare it to the Java example. Quite similar, right? Let me emphasize. So this is your metadata. This is your annotations in Java. This is your extends keyword. I'm using the dot suite. And this is your dependency injection with this simple property. And these are your two methods. If you think this is kind of, you, I'm losing you, yeah, it's already complicated, but let me explain you why. The dot suite actually works here. You see, I'm using chain dot suite dot compose dot test dot test. Dot suite returns a new stem. Dot compose returns a new stem. Dot test returns a new stem. And at the end, I get the test example stem. Um, so, as you can see, suite static method calls this dot compose. So it merges this stem, whatever it is at that point of time, with some more metadata, which is deep configuration in this case, and dot uh, test method, static method, also adds a few more metadata and creates a new stem and returns a new stem. So on the bottom, I can chain them like that. You, do you understand that every static method works similar to dot compose, just tweaked? And this is the final metadata of that test example stem. If I'll print text example dot compose, I will find those four different metadata things. Deep configuration properties, configuration methods. There are 
10 different types in our standard. This is the second thing. We standardize in our uh, STEM specification. 10 different metadata you can use. Don't actually read them. It's not really important at the moment. Now, let's talk about this magic. So this magic is nothing else but simply merging the metadata. And by merging, I mean literally merging. Here I'm using shell merge. Uh, we are using shell merge to merge some of the metadata. And here we are using deep merge to merge some of the metadata. And here we are using array concatenation for initializers. That's the magic. So that's, that's it. That's actually the main slide. That's actually why I actually get to CampJS, to show you that slide. That's the essence of the stamps. You just merge the data. Okay. Um, it's 10 of 3. Uh, we started a little bit late. Uh, I have a few more slides, actually, 13 to show you, and they are about awesome features of stamps. If you want to go to the other thing, so you have all the necessary information about stamps. If you are interested to go the other talk, then go ahead. If you're keen to see awesome features you didn't notice, then I'll move on. All right, so the dot .compose method is actually detachable. What I mean by detachable? For example, you import a stamp from who knows where, third party place, and you can detach the dot .compose method by like this. So, you see, the compose variable is nothing else but third party stamp dot compose. And now you can reuse this dot uh, standalone compose method as uh, just, just to create new stamps, just like that. Just like that. Do you, do you understand that? All right. So why we have this? Because I wish the dot then method of promises was also detachable as easy as the dot compose method, so that I can just reuse implementation from some third party module. And that would be amazing, because in my projects I usually have several implementations of promises like Q, Bluebird, native, and all all the same in the same application. I mean, it could, but it wouldn't be great because then it's it bound to that object. Yeah, yeah. So in, in your example, well, yes, you can do it because you're just reusing yeah. it. Yeah, I'm not, but it's not bound. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I can't do this, unfortunately. Just nothing. Um, another cool feature is you can override the dot .compose method. Let me show you. And now, you are importing this compose implementation from who knows where and then you are creating a wrapper function so this is a wrapper function what it does it just uh, wraps the compose uh, function as you can see it, it just called the compose function originally but it also logs everything you pass to it and also it adds one more uh, behavior so that's why the function name is infected compose. It always, if you call it, it always infects the return stamp with uh, one more metadata, which in this case is the compose static property. I'll show you later how this beautifully works. So in these cases, you're using the standalone infected compose function, and here you're using standalone infected compose function, and all these five calls are directly calling the infected compose, as you can see. But the magic goes here. Magic. Dot compose in this case is the static property, which actually references that. Thing on the top, which is referencing the infected compose. So it's like it's re referencing itself. So whenever a new stamp is created, the dot compose method is infected, 
kind of a, with a, a different implementation. So my user is a, uh, is a stamp which have only one initializer, which expects a password as an argument, and then it just prints the length of this password. But if I try to create it with, without any argument, it will throw cannot read property password of undefined. And if I'll pass the password but it is null, it will throw cannot read property length of null. And you can create APIs like that. Uh, you grab argument checker scan, it'll show, I'll show you later what it is. And you call argument checker dot check arguments, which is also a, a uh, static function. Then you pass an argument saying password should be a string, and then you compose it with my user. And then my safe user stamp, whenever you execute it, it will uh, throw a readable exception saying argument password must be a string. Uh, how it's implemented, it's, uh, oh, that's a wrong slide. No, it's not. Uh, so these two exceptions will be thrown in these two places. And then here is what I'm actually showing you. Sorry, let's let's move on faster. Yeah, yeah. So when you said um, it's not password, it's not password. So I should inside each um, uh, stamp and compose them together. They are actually compatible properly, so that this not password is not accessible to. It it is accessible to all initializers. Okay. If there are multiple initializers. Okay, so where's the private? It's private properties are closures inside initializers. So, like you're creating properties on that. Yep. 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 Like a regular. Yeah, yeah, but that's a different story. Let's, uh, let's move on. So, let me show you how argument checker is implemented. So, it declares that the argument checker will have one static property called check arguments. You've seen it. Then, what it does, it just calls the compose on itself and uh, adds a few. Uh, adds one more metadata called argument checker, so just same name. Uh, and then it also declares the same argument checker stamp. It also declares that it will have an initializer. What it will do, it will grab the metadata of itself. You see this const map equals blah blah blah. And then it just iterates over the given arguments and then check types of given argument, blah, 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 blah. And throws an exception argument, password must be a string. Uh, and this is the full code of this uh, stem. And you can see I'm reusing uh, the metadata from the uh, data from the deep configuration metadata here. So that's, that's it. That's the argument check stamp. Uh, it's that's more. And uh, what I don't like in this example is that it's bulky. It's big, but too much, too much code. And there is a module called Stampit to just uh, simplify, to shorten the code basically. Uh, there it is. So I'm using this uh, statics. Statics is nothing else but a uh, uh, static method itself. So here on the top, I'm creating a new stamp, which have the dot statics static method, and also it's have dot deep configuration deep conf static method, and also it has the dot init static method. So, so stamp it is nothing else but an infected compose function. It just adds all those static functions for you. Uh, and yeah. Uh, exactly the same uh, object used here. I hope that's clear. If, if it's not, it's not important. So, the last slide, when to use stamps. Uh, you should use stamps instead of classes. That's, I'm using stamps for two years, and I haven't written a single class since, and I'm loving it. And people who embrace stamps, they also, they often come back to me or to, to the group of us who's developing that, and they say, wow, this is so amazing, so so great, like, 
thank you for doing this. So we have lots of uh, people who, who liking it after understanding it. I understand it's too complicated to understand right now because it's a new paradigm in software development in general because you're like merging metadata, merging metadata. It's hard to embrace, but as soon as you understand it, it's just easy like that. So, instead of classes, then um, when you have, when your code have a lot of similar objects, if you have ever developed games, have you ever heard of craft wooden old unique improved dwarf sword? And these all are behaviors, right? And each one can be a stem. Uh, and from my experience, we had its subscription types, so whenever our customers decided to use our service, we have various subscription types like free pro enterprise, yearly, monthly, direct debit or invoice, credit card or bank account, and all of these are better be stacks. And etc. You probably have your own examples of the similar objects you have in, in your code. Um, also, stamp is really great, and I highly recommend it, for dependency injection. Uh, especially in complex business logic apps. So, example from my, uh, from my experience. Your code goes to one service, goes to second service, then it merges the data, and then it uploads the data to database, and then it returns something to the user. So it's like five lines of code, but you need to write a unit test for it. How would you do, how would you mock four different uh, network calls? So stamps are really great for it, because it's got these properties metadata, where you can inject anything. Okay, let's go on. Um, it's great for HTTP request handlers, uh, as I'm a dot, the .js developer, and I try to use this as much as I can, stamps as much as I can, because of the dependency injection easiness, so that I can ab abstract my code from HTTP protocol, from any uh, Node.js framework, or from database, or from other services. Uh, yeah, I just told you that interdependent microservice logic is easy to mock. And in your, in your case, you might have like, file system dependencies and I don't know, Slack dependencies. Also, the last thing, I truly believe this is, this is true, that stamps would be better as a UI components in React, Ember, Vue, Angular, Meteor, whatever, any UI components would be better as stamps. Because, well, you can simply attach new behaviors to your components with the dot .compose. I don't have evidence for that. I truly believe this is like that. There are no evidence, but you, I'm, I'm going to find them, yeah. I have a question. So, how do you find this integrates with, like, if it's, say, JavaScript code and with, say, libraries? Uh, how, how, is it, how complicated it is to integrate a new NPM module, you're asking? Or how, how complicated it is? Think this is a class. How complicated it is to integrate class into your application. <laughs> so that, that, that's what I'm coming to. Yeah, it's just when you have the same code and it doesn't use us, the way that you call things, you build things, you modify them, you extend them, it's completely different. And then because of this like, code, we've already had the way to build things like say the JavaScript models or the S6 classes, and then you introduce a completely new class model. How well is it? Okay. No, no, you, I don't believe you should mix different paradigms in a single code base. That's unproductive, I believe. It's, it's like, I guess it's like promises, so you, you potentially can uh, isolate part of the application and use it, and like, gradual, gradually migrate other parts as well, because, again, like having the big callback code base and then introducing promises, the promises are in fact the application at some point, you just really want to write all the application promises. Uh, this is something similar, so you can always... No. You can't Stamps are not similar. No, you, you don't need, it does not infect your entire code base. I mean, you, you want to do infecting multiple things, so you want to do that, but 
you can always rapidly in and get those things out of it, right? So you can take SAMP and use it as just a function of it. Yes. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't, for example, write an event that would take not be from someone who might have a conservative or something. Yeah, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> sure. It's JavaScript. Yeah, of course. So any of the three prior identifiers to get monthly, are you in that case creating SAMP style output? Uh, no, you're yeah, not. Do you just exactly create one with every single combination of all of them? Yeah. <coughs> and then export it uh, from a file. Yeah. yeah. That is, okay. When not to use stamps? Um, the list is not full. First of all, I wouldn't recommend you if you're already using classes and ECMAScript 6, don't migrate your code to stamps. Try it. Try it on a different project, because otherwise well, people, other developers will get confused. And it's a new paradigm, nobody knows it, and uh, yeah, you don't want to code using things nobody knows. <laughs> so, um, uh, those deep, deep merged things and properties, they, Whenever your code is like, like really, you need to squeeze every CPU cycle from your code, do not use stamps. Uh, they're not a performance problem at all. What I'm trying to say is that if you really need all the CPU cycles you have, check the Bluebird uh, source code. They do it really great, but the code is unreadable. What I'm trying to say is, is that stamps are not a bottleneck in your application. Usually the bottleneck is network request or too much DOM operations or uh, database calls are too laggy. I have never met it in my experience in two years uh, the case when stamps were a uh, performance issue. So don't use it in games high performance games when you like need to create thousands of, of, of objects per second. But you can create use it in games if, if for swords and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use it in drivers of course because of pre cost performance. And in small utility modules modules also do not use stamps. You know left pad does not need a stamp to be a function. Unless you want to have less time. <laughs> Unless I am, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, guys, if you are building a new language, if you are building something, if you are building a new language, okay, let's say, or, or a compiler for a new language, please omit classes. Please omit classes and inheritance this banana jungle problem, you know what I'm saying. Who knows what the banana jungle problem is? One, two, three, four, half of the people. So this means, doesn't really matter. What do you mean, what do you mean? Okay, so banana and jungle problem, it's a quote from Joe Armstrong, I don't know who he is, <laughs> saying that there is a problem with classic OOP programming. Whenever you want a banana, you get also a gorilla holding a banana and the entire jungle. And that was on one of my first slides with this big bulk, big bulky, uh, useless shit. Um, consider stamps instead or any other similar composable behaviors so that you can compose your whatever object from a small reusable. I don't have an answer for that. I need to understand what Go language is. I have never tried it. Sorry. You mentioned the Gorilla Banana problem, but if you have a type of inheritance, most of the problems of the Gorilla Banana problem are not as dangerous as classical <laughs> development, right? Can you speak up? Okay, let's speak up. So you mentioned the Gorilla Banana problem, and from, from what I can see, the prototypal uh, nature of Object-oriented programming based on prototypes doesn't have 
a lot the, pro the problems that the Gorilla Banana problem have. So, is that what do you think about this? Is that does that make sense? Avoid classes. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Okay. There, there is no prototype on inheritance here. We are using prototypes to store methods, but single prototype actually. So stamp it, uh, stamps underneath those methods you saw on one of the slides. They are being merged to a single object, and then it becomes a prototype in terms of JavaScript. So, yeah, it's kind of a mixing. We can make the decision between creating a new stamp and modifying a previous one. Is some something like heuristic or rule for that? Well, it's it's common sense. If if you need to reuse the stamp you're creating in one more place, then yeah, make it a different stamp. If you don't need to reuse it, embed it into any system. Go back to your go back to the slide that has implementation, the magic slide. Who is coming last wins? Yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is assigned. So here, this is for me, it scares the shit out of me when I this here. Because yeah, this is a that, that's by design. Yeah, because you're basically changing the implementation here. So anytime you get this object, it's getting trashed by this object. Yeah. And I would like from a functional programming standpoint, say, holy shit, don't do that. Like put an empty object there. Yeah, so that you true. like merge the two together. I don't know if that would lead to bugs, but I would Oh you mean they're they are modifying the They're changing this is being assigned this is this is getting assigned to this. So if this, oh, this overrides that That's by design. Yeah. yeah. So I know it's by design and it makes sense, but I'm still like that might lead to that, that question always comes from people who do I implement large classes. When you have large classes with many methods, this could become a problem. But with stamps, stamps are tend to be small in each one. Then you merge them and you typically, con typically control them, what overrides what. And at the end, you get a stamp with a couple of methods, a couple of properties, and that's it. There is no uh, well, method the thing is, the destination self starts as an empty object. It doesn't start as <coughs> something you pass. In. So the destination yeah, right. itself is a new object. Okay. The destination, the destination is being moved in an existing set or second set. Your phone, you right? have a destination which is new. This, this is the internal bit. So how does it call for They are yeah. immutable yeah. initially. Right. All yeah. the stamps are new. All the stamps are new. And you take the previous step. Yeah. Yeah. You set a new set of keys and you create a new stamp. Yeah. So basically, the destination methods is an empty object if you do a new step. Yep. This is a new object. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so you talked a lot about sort of how this solves problems in um, other kinds of programs. Is it the functional program? Yep. It's more complicated talk and thing. Uh, I wouldn't answer it right now because it, it would take even more long more time than I just spent your time on you. It's almost our, I'm sorry. We enjoyed it, don't be sorry. Uh, okay, uh, but yes, uh, it's got a couple of features and I'm on the first slide you saw, uh, no, second slide. There is medium.com slash Kosa, which is me. Uh, I'll be posting more stories about how stamps add to, to functional programming. Uh, there is one article already about that. I have six of them right now. And yes, there are a couple of things I want to uh, show to people. You said you've written a spec, you're using it for a few years already. You said you've written a specification for it. Are yeah. you bound to buy a 39 or any stamp for it? So the story is following. Stamps exist as an idea more than two years. It was used privately in Adobe in other large companies. Stamps version 1, Stamps version 2, which uh, I, uh, in, well, I took the Stamp version 1 extended with Stamp version 2, but then we were thinking of Stamp version 3 and we had disagreements. So I had this idea to create uh, 
a specification which would be as minimalistic as possible and, and you probably saw it already that this is the entire specification it is kind of a minimalistic uh, the, the sample implementation takes 77 lines so it's kind of as minimalistic as a Redux, for example. We were thinking of, uh, we are still thinking of uh, proposing this thing to TC39, but it needs to get uh, more mature. Uh, otherwise, well, it would be a waste. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. I am thinking of to, I know there are languages that, where you can write plugins for, like Babel stuff, and I think Swift. With Swift, you can add plugins to the language, right? Uh, and there are other languages like Python. I'm thinking of extending, for example, Swift with stamps, writing a plugin or so, uh, to like showcase the thing, and maybe from that. DC39 would consider it. I don't know. We'll see. But thanks yeah, for the question. Like to have yeah, yeah. We are working on multiple uh, in the, not uh, implementations. Yep. All right. I think no more questions. And thank you. And goodbye. <laughs>